Hey guys, Harley from Cricket Fanatics Magazine here with another episode of Legends with Ravi. Now, we've got a very, very interesting, interesting panel for you today and obviously interesting guests here for you today. But before we get started, you know what to do. You know, you need to click this like button, you need to share, comment in the comment section below, of course, because we'll get to your questions later on in the show. I just want to talk to you a little bit until Ravi gets ready to, to come online. Um, we obviously had some issues at the beginning with some technical difficulties, etc. because StreamYard has changed their whole interface. So um, we had to basically get everything ready. Um, so when Ravi is ready, I will bring him into the stream. But there was a lot of interesting things that happened around cricket. And um, I'm happy that we could still get these few things going and we could have episodes of Legends with Ravi and etc. down the line. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Ravi and let's get the show on the road. How's it, Ravi? How are you doing? Hey, how's it, Kandi? How are you? You well? Um, good, thanks, man. Good to see you again. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I had a bit of a fright there with the laptop, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll get things sorted out with the stream out in the long run. But thanks for having me. No, no problem, no problem. So, you know how we get this off. Um, it's your time to educate me. Um, obviously, especially about the legends of, of the game that I've missed and haven't got to see play, obviously. So, um, just give me your your brief history about Fanny de Villiers, of course. And, of course, just give me the first moment that you saw him play. Uh, when, did it, when, when was that? Awesome. Thanks. Eh? I mean, when it comes to Fadi de Villiers, he was one of the guys as a youngster I used to try and emulate the, my bowling action. Uh, it was uh, either him or it was Pollock and a bit of Darren Goff. But I always liked uh, Fadi's way of bowling. He would like almost hide the ball behind his back uh, while while uh, doing his run up. And uh, I always found it like to be quite a unique way of bowling. And uh, Look, I mean, uh, what is it, uh, 20 yard test, um, 85 wickets later, and uh, we're talking about him today. Fantastic player. When he caught my eye, I would say the 1994 tour of Australia. So there was a tour of Australia when we went over, went across to them. Um, that was to play Alan Borders' uh, test team. And one particular test, and I'm sure Fani himself will go into tremendous detail about this was when uh, Australia were given a total a target of 115 to get. And unfortunately for them, uh, they were almost jinxed by the by the then uh, Tony Gregg, who was uh, um, commentating at the time, saying this is the shoe in, this is easy for Australia. They're going to get this within the next uh, 20 overs or so. And unfortunately, Fanny De Villiers and Alan Donald had something else uh, to say in, in uh, contention of that. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, so definitely um, a fantastic player, a match winner of note, uh, quite a few notable tours, and certainly one of the more quirkier personalities on the team. That's awesome. So we are going to bring on Fanny right now. Um, but before I say that, I just want to say thank you to everybody for tuning in. I know it's the start of the Premier League and everybody's excited about that starting. But um, thank you for everybody that has tuned in, <laughs> tuned in for, to, this, to this live stream. Um, get your comments in the comment section below because we will be answering them later in the show, especially ask a lot of questions to Fanny because this is an opportunity that I don't think a lot of people get and we are really excited about this one. So without further ado, uh, let's introduce our first our main guest on the show. So, hello Fanny, evening, how are you doing? Well, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, it's good to see you. It's a great job you guys are doing and then also you're picking the coldest night to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could have picked a colder night, eh? <laughs> have you got your fireplace out you there, uh, Fanny? Yeah, it's not, I'm not close to the fireplace, so I'm uh, definitely for the next twenty or thirty or forty minutes, I'm away from that. But uh, I'll, I'll definitely take you up for a beer one day to repay me. <laughs> awesome, awesome. <laughs> Great stuff. I think you and Alan Dawson share something in common. He did his interview next to the fireplace as well. So uh, you guys seem to have some synergies there. <laughs> yeah, fine. Well, you obviously didn't hear what I said. I said I'm away from the fireplace. Oh, you're I'm away from the no, kitchen. So sorry, man. <laughs> I'm away from the fireplace. I'm sorry, you owe me a beer. The next hour, I'm going to have cold feet, to be honest. 
So speaking of your household, uh, I, I have to ask now, I, I think we spoke about this uh, a few hours ago, but do you still have those rugby poles outside the property? Yes, it's just outside the house. Uh, the boys are kicking poles and uh, whenever you come here, you have to kick through it first. You have to goal kick first and have to make it. You get about six, seven balls to do it. And if you don't, you, uh, you don't allow, you're not allowed to drink. So uh, otherwise, you're just drinking tea. But it's, it's, it's a nice little, it's a nice little area. What's the soccer spielers, my dear? What's going to be the ball is copy? You can get a slice from the pole. I'll give you some slice. I'll there. hit the crossbar. How's that? I'll hit the crossbar. Would that, be, would that suffice? <laughs> that, 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 that would be cool. Awesome. Awesome. So thanks for coming on the show, man. And uh, again, the, um, it, it's so great to have uh, yet another Protea on the show as well. Um, there are quite a few momentous uh, occasions during your career. And I think uh, one thing I'd like to do is a bit of an icebreaker. Uh, maybe if you could just share with the fans, um, and some of our young, younger fans might be wondering, what does our title mean? And the title of the show is The Protea and the Queen. And I believe you had an audience of the Queen as far as 26 years ago. Do you want to talk us through that interaction? Well, to be honest with you, that, that specific uh, uh, interaction was very quick. She walked straight past me and Pat Simcox and Dave Richardson and everybody else. Uh, if, you, if you go back into cricket books, there's always somebody uh, that, that, that spreads the word of a, of a little joke that happened with somebody and and what they, what they obviously labelled me now with, is that I spoke to the Queen, and uh, and it, and it's honestly this 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 is an old story as old as the hills, um, with meeting uh, with people meeting the Queen, calling her your High Worshipness, and they've labelled me. I'm not too sure. I thought they would have labelled Mary Pringle or one of those, but uh, obviously the story probably fits my personality or something. I'm not too sure, but it's it's not true. It's not true. It's it's a, it's a wonderful story, but it's not true. But it must have been a, quite an interesting occasion because you, in your career, you would have met obviously politicians, uh, businessmen, mm. and obviously in this case, royalty. Um, it must have been a hell of a lot of uh, uh, protocols that were given to you guys before the audience with the Queen. Yeah, well, nobody really. I mean, we were just, uh, they just told us we were going to be standing in a queue and obviously uh, we were going to uh, um, meet her. But I think, I think this, this, the story, Behind the scenes makes it more interesting. But talking about people that you meet, from Paul Getty right through to uh, John Major, I remember after a test match in England, he came into the dressing room and he sat next to me. And uh, we had a wonderful chat about cricket and, and about everything. And uh, a lot of people that's high profile uh, loves the game of cricket. And it's wonderful for those guys always to come and visit. Uh, I think in the early days, when we just started playing international cricket in 1993, it was only Elsa's time. And he used to That's bring right. friends around, uh, golfing friends around to come and meet us. And it was brilliant to see those players and to rub shoulders with him. And I think that's the spice of life. Dad, that died about um, 12, 13 years back, he used to say to me, my boy, he said, go out there, enjoy the life uh, of, a, of a tourist, the life of a cricket player playing cricket overseas, and uh, try and find things that you can call the spice of life. And the, the spice of life is definitely those kind of interactions with people. I remember myself and, and, and Jeffrey Boycott, um, when he also arrived in the dressing room, obviously with his big mouth, uh, I started tackling him. Uh, and, and at one stage, at one stage, I uh, said to him, nobody loves a smart ass. And that's when John Major got up and he says, listen, I think I'm going to leave this fight. So uh, a lot of things happened in the dressing room, and, and that was one of those. So you had your first international debate uh, while on the cricket tour. Fantastic. Uh, and talk us through um, your, your first tour of Australia, the 93-94 tour of Australia. We'll certainly get into the Sydney test as well, but there were theatrics on and off the field. Would you like to take us through uh, Brian Mack and his uh, altercation with good old, uh, the original AB in Australia? Yeah, you, know, you know what happened? Um, I, think, I think we need to just uh, take people back to when we started off. 
from 72 yeah. to 92, they were no international cricket. And we obviously, I heard Dorsey last week talk about um, the mess and edges cricket. And, and I can elaborate and, uh, and I think it would be remiss not to, uh, not to allude to the full stadiums that we had. I mean, it was sold out stadiums. Uh, watching best and edges cricket between Northerns and Western Province or, or, or Gauteng and, and Western Province, wherever we were. Even in the countryside, uh, when you go to Virginia and those places, people were outside queuing for tickets that wasn't there anymore. And it was a wonderful era of cricket. And when we started playing cricket in 92, international cricket into the true, uh, into the true sense of, of, of international cricket, um, most of us were 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33 years old. So not only calculated cricket players, um, also I thought uh, effective cricket players, but we were ambassadors. We were good ambassadors. We were calculated in the sense of handling people, handling the media, um, handling the supporters uh, on and off the field. And on top of that, um, I think we were very calculated in the humor that we caused at the grounds and on the fields and off the fields. Um, uh, from playing cricket in Sydney, I remember Melbourne, the first test match, uh, before that Sydney test match that you, gonna, that you alluded to, um, we were in it at tea time. I remember staying behind and I got one of the boys' cricket bats over the fence at one at side and I said, have you got a ball? And he said, yes. And I said, come, jump over the fence. Let's, uh, let's get some catches going. And the security guards tried to stop these kids, but I pulled about 10, 12 kids over the fence. And in tea time, three, four of us were hitting catches to the youngsters on the, on the oval. And it was fantastic. Um, I think it was the same too. I'm not too sure how old were you then. Ravi, how old are you now? Take a while, guess. <laughs> oh, well, well, 45? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I was off the craft, yeah. um, I'm, I'm 37, actually. <laughs> it's difficult to see. So I, I was Anyways, about 10, 11 years old when you, when you told Australia. I just want to take you back to that to that uh, specific scenario. We ended up, uh, and I'm asking you if you did watch everything, because you remember the, the remote control car that I used to take on the field? And that became a that. hit in Australia. And I should I should have patented it because obviously everybody's using a remote control car to bring out drinks and the and the and the kicking the stick and everything. You know what I mean? But uh, the tea. But that's where, the reality that's where was. That's you crashed the stumps, yeah. You crashed the stumps. That's with right. The, yeah. <laughs> we we really got into the hearts of the Australian supporters. We did that in England. We did that in Pakistan. We did that in India. I think we were very calculated because we were all twenty eight to 35 years old. We had the University of Life degree on how to play cricket and how to handle people. And I think that made us a, a very likable team. And, and I don't know if you've got fond memories of that specific time, but I think we were great ambassadors for South African cricket. Not all the exploits that the guys are getting up to now or the, from, from about 2000 onwards, well, uh, it wasn't the well, same before you're... then. So, so I, I'm inherently, I'm a Windies fan uh, by, by, by passion. I was actually born in Trinidad myself. So Brian Lara all the way. But one uh, performance that really got me hooked onto the game was your performance in the second test in Sydney. Maybe talk the fans through that experience. I, I kind of alluded to that uh, right at the beginning before you arrived. But talk us through the events which led to the eventual victory in that match. Um, first test match, Melbourne got rained out. We started touring, um, uh, playing against number one in the world, Australia. Nobody gave us a chance. We had that uh, World Cup in Australia that they thought that we played better than, than, than we should have, everybody said. And then, obviously, this tour took place. Second test match, Sydney. Um, a turning wicket. I had a look at the results before the game started, and it was very much a turning wicket for spinners. And we were worried about the spinning uh, capacity of the players and obviously Shane Warne was one of them till May um, but I ended up being quite successful in the test match because of uh, the off cutters of all the variations that I had that I that I taught myself uh, the season or two before in England um, when the seam was down uh, they actually reduced the seam of the ball to to kind of eliminate the swing uh, and the effectiveness of swing bowling in England because of the weather that year it was the
driest 1989, the driest season in England, uh, similar 1976. Um, and, and I had to bowl a lot of variations because within the first five to ten overs, I couldn't swing the ball anymore because it was too scuffed up. It's typical Pakistan kind of scuffing the ball of the wicket. And luckily, I had those variations. And on that specific turf, it worked out very well for me. Um, for the people that didn't watch the test match, you know, there's uh, 15 two-hour sessions in a test match, um, three two-hour sessions per day. Uh, when you play a test match, you try and win and get to six, seven uh, sessions that you can win, then you give yourself a chance to win the test match. Hmm. In actual fact, that test match only lasted 13 sessions um, of the 15, when we obviously won the game at the end. Um, bowling them out on 111, they needed 117 to win. Uh, but we lost 11 of the 13 sessions and we still won the test match. Now, that's a game of cricket. That's how you can get that, back that, into this. Absolutely. Test Without a doubt, yeah, and, and, and I, I don't know if the fans know this, but Tony Gregg gave no iota of a chance to the to the Proteas at the time. I remember him going on camera saying, there's no chance South Africa have here. They're probably going to wrap this up in about 20, 25 overs. Yes, 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 his exact words were, South Africa got a million to one chances to win this test match the night before. Sure. And I remember the next day at the ground, it was an empty ground, we probably had about 500 South African supporters that obviously paid for the tickets beforehand and they had to come and, and, and watch the next day's play. Um, I took the first four wickets the previous day, so we had them 60-odd for four. Um, I thought I was going to have a chance to get to 10 wickets. Uh, didn't get the early wickets, but I got two more later on to, to have a tally of four at the end to get to 10. Um, bowled 16 overs on a trot. From the first ball to the last ball, when uh, the last over before tea, um, from the first ball to the last over before tea, so uh, before lunch, um, it was a hell of a, a, a fitness challenge. But uh, luckily, the line and length and the variations that I had, and the off cutters for left handers, and obviously for right, right handers, the LBWs came in play, and we ended up pulling off uh, uh, the most extraordinary win that I've seen in a very, very long time. And they all in that, for that matter, for the last 20 years commentating cricket, I haven't seen anything as close as that. But one needs to categorize good games. And I think you, you have to categorize uh, this in the category of emotional wins. And an emotional yes. win is ever, it's so much better than playing at Lords or Calcutta and beating a team in three or four days. Um, when you come back from behind, it makes it sweet. It makes it uh, memorable. And, uh, and I think we've, we've, we've gathered ourselves a lot of support from South African supporters and also Aussie supporters. And I could see that in the media um, and, and, and the interest that they had in us, obviously, throughout the tour. And, and tell me, funny, and I'll certainly hand over to Khalid after this. Tell me, um, what is it, what is the, how does it feel beating the likes of an Australian, a fully kitted Australian team? versus that of every other opposition in the world? Because there seems to be something more special about beating an Australian side. doesn't matter which era we're talking about. There seems to be some sort of special feeling about that. Uh, can you perhaps describe that? Yeah, especially on home turf. Um, if, if you would ask me, um, who have I got the most respect for? It would be Australia above the West Indies, above Pakistan, India, above England. Um, and the reason for that, uh, they just, they're just just an effective nation. They do things right. The cricket nets are better than anybody else's. Uh, the innovation coming out of their system is, is way beyond uh, uh, most countries' reach. Um, the proactiveness, uh, the, I, I, can, I can actually elaborate on... On, on how they treat the, the, the cricket players in the media, how important the cricket players are when it comes to advertising. You know, I found it very strange uh, the first time I got there because every 10th billboard had a cricket player on um, advertising their products. And I, and I saw a little bit of that in India with Tendulkar that was the face of, of 20, 30 companies. Um, Australia was the same. They valued their, their sportsmen. Um, the stadiums in 1956, and, and I need to, uh, I wasn't born then. Ravi, I thought you were born then. But uh, <laughs> 1956, 
1956 <laughs> Olympic oh, Games, I think it was in Rome. That stadium houses more people than the Wanderers and Centurion together. It's fascinating to go to those places. And obviously, you get to a cricket field, and I'm an old javelin thrower that can throw a, a, a cricket ball about 100 meters. And I struggle to reach the, the, the cricket stumps from the end. Obviously, the footy grounds that you play cricket on. Massive stadiums. The best in the world. The best that I've Huge. seen. Never been to Auckland stadiums. An effective nations that support their players. Uh, that hasn't got the divisions that we have in our country. Uh, everybody is behind everybody. And, and part of, of me stopping playing cricket, fed up with, with uh, what's going on behind the scenes, because... Uh, People started calling Jack Callis a racist and this oak, this and that guy, this and uh, half the team not supporting that team. And it hurts. It's, it's, it's fair, but it hurts. And Australia had none of that. They were clean cut, straightforward. It's wonderful to see those uh, people support their, their players. And the players with the patriotism they, they've got, that makes them special. And that makes them special to be. And uh, it's a pity that we didn't win that tour. Because uh, or won that uh, specific series because the game after that was in Adelaide, and that's uh, yes. I had a broken thumb, didn't take the wicket in the game, couldn't bowl second in, and Craig came and in ended up batting with Peter Kirk. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, you I ended up, I ended up batting. Were... No, I played, I played, you but played. I ended up going in as night watch, batted before, ended up getting out before drinks the next day, um, after lunch, and when my wicket fell, uh. Daryl A became part of, of history. And he and him and his partner shot seven guys like Clint Eastwood. Uh, terrible decisions. And we should have drawn that game and won the series in Australia against the best in the world. Well, if it's any token, he's done that for his entire career. Good old Daryl. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Khalid, do you perhaps have any questions for, for Fani? So for me, it's all about, I mean, for me, not having been able to watch cricket back then. Um, I mean, the, the you, years... just, you, know, you you also look about 36. <laughs> I'm 28, so like <laughs> I, was, I was born oh, with you know, some say, of the games you, that you guys are speaking you about. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I wanted to ask you is um, obviously, I want to try to compare generations, etc. Now, we've gone obviously through. Cycles. You can say cricket goes through cycles. I had an interview with Michael Holding asking him about our current crop of players. And he told me that we shouldn't worry because it goes through cycles. You have your years where there's strong opposition, then you'll dip, and then you'll get strong again, and you'll dip again. But um, that crop of players that you played with, um, there's some credible names that you would have seen coming through the system, of course, like the names of Jock Cullis, and all, and you said, mentioned like some of the guys like Sean Pollock and that, right, the younger generation coming through that system. What was it like? What what made them different or set them apart from everybody else? Um, I think there's two traits that, that South Africa had above most teams. And I think that is exactly what Gary Kirsten took to India. Um, you need to be calculated enough, academically enough, to, to want to learn, to want to find out, to be inquisitive, to be teachable. And I think we had those traits. Most of us, as I said, we were 28 plus years old. All of us studied. All of us had degrees. All of us, all of us had been to uni. Um, the only youngsters that we had in our midst was Hansi Kunia and, and, and um, uh, 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 John T. Rhodes. Um, and that caliber person, I think, adapts quicker, learns quicker, are more innovative. I remember a meeting that we had um, when Bob Wilmer took over the coaching. He said to he said to us, chaps, why can't everybody? be part of, of developing and evolving the game of cricket. Why is it only coming from what we normally call the click, two, three guys? And everybody had to go away and come back with some advice on how we can better the game of cricket and how we can better the game of fielding, how we can better the game of bowling and obviously spin bowling for that matter. And everybody thought about it, had a look at it, um, visualized most probably changes and and we had the most amazing uh, new, new innovative ideas coming from the players. When everybody, from Paul Adams later on, right through to Richard Snell, to Adrian Caper, to everybody, 
that said, boys, this has worked for me. That I think we should do. Let's try this. Why don't we do that? And suddenly we just played better cricket than anybody else. And I'm talking about one day cricket because test cricket mm. is a game that you need to, for 20 years, we didn't play test cricket. And it was hard for us to get back. But I think in that specific time, just at one stage, we played about 54, 55 matches. And I think we won about 45, 46 of them. Uh, everything just worked beautifully from the new innovativeness on the fielding side to, to how to bowl Yorkers. And I was obviously one of the guys that, that got, got it right to, to, to be able to bowl Yorkers. And, and I tried to put that into the team, but it, it takes a long time for something to develop. And I think Jack Callis, the likes of Boucher, the likes of a Macayantini, uh, a Sean Pollock are the result um, of the evolving, the evolution that took place in that early 90s that we played international cricket. Um, we just took everything to the next level, from fitness to muscle, to muscle endurance, to diet, to uh, psychology. Um, very inquisitive, very teachable cricket players. And that made a massive difference, I think, for the future generations. And you mentioned as well, because um, your, your, the amount of variations you bowled, etc. Obviously, you also have the nickname for Nagafani. So can you maybe give me the origins of that? Um, and also the importance of you having those different types of variations in your game and what you could maybe, what some sort of tips you can give to other bowlers out there, younger generation bowlers that um, are trying to do exactly the same thing because there's this, there's this assumption, obviously, that there's that a lot of the younger bowlers coming through the system only have like one or two weapons in their in arsenal. Um, we entered the era of, of Adrian Kaper really smacking the ball around in the first few overs. Um, Ravi, I thought you would have remembered me, not for the Sydney game, but for for the, the match at Newlands when Omar Henry uh, played a game for his benefit. And, and I was a young up-and-coming fast bowler that was on, on, on everybody's mind, um, taking a lot of wickets. I'd actually Probably wasn't so in the country at the time. <laughs> that, were you there? I don't think so. Okay, okay. Are we talking 93? 92, 93? Yes, it was just earlier. They're probably, yeah, probably, no, no, it's probably in the late 80s, 88, 89, 89, 90. That's right. But in any case, um, Adrian Kaper, um, yeah, Adrian Kaper came into bat, uh, opening the batting for the specific game. I made the President's 11, Golf, LaRue was playing, um, Clive Rice was playing. They, they, they even they even had one of the West Indian fast bowlers to play with us against this specific uh, Omar Henry team. And uh, he walked into bat. Uh, myself, Kenny McEwen, and Mike Rindle were the players of the year. We were the South African cricket players of the year. So obviously there was a lot expected from us. Um, Rindle and McEwen um, uh, couldn't do anything, obviously, on the batting side. On the bowling side, I thought, okay, now I need to lift my game and, and, and stand in for the boys that didn't do it. Um, he came into bat, and we all thought, what the hell is he opening the batting for? And I came in to run. Clive Rice was the captain. Um, he, uh, he he threw me the ball and says, listen, swing it away. Uh, let's nip a couple out and, 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 and keep it simple, keep it uh, uh, conservative, because they're going to play shots. We'll get, we're especially capable will get him out. Now, the first ball was hit straight into the oaks of the game. The second one, another six. The third one, a Chinese cut for four. And after three deliveries, obviously a lot of runs on my name already in the first over, Clive Rice came to me. He says to me, now what the hell is happening here? I said, well, you don't speak to Adrian Kaper. Yeah? He's got no respect. And needless to say, after three overs, I didn't want to bowl anymore because I went for about 40 in three. Um... Uh, I ro the, he rolled me the ball for the fifth over to ball, the eighth over of the game, and I rolled it back to him. So he rolled it to, to Gav Leroux. Gav Leroux rolled it back to him. Did he pull the chapel? Then he rolled Did he pull the chapel? <laughs> yeah. And we were still walking towards the middle. I said, I'm not bowling anymore. In any case, and Clive Rice got the ball and rolled it back to me again. He says, you got to bowl again. Luckily, the fourth over, I bowled the maiden. And that was against, uh, um, I can't remember who opened the batting with him, obviously a more conservative player. And the fifth over, uh, from, from my side, the 10th of the game, I had to bowl again. And Adrian Caper was facing, needless to say, I went for 65 runs in five overs, and I bowled a maiden. Now, that's <laughs> the kind of cricket that 
firstly was played, and 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 that's how the game evolved to to where we are now. And I think the tips that you're talking about. Um, uh, we played in an era where the game changed, where we had to find ways. Uh, the Anchorman cricket players wasn't there anymore. Kepler Vessels wasn't part of the system after a few tours. And uh, we started playing with pinch hitters at start. And that's where the game evolved because the, 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 uh, the game allowed it to evolve. A lot of people tried to compare. You're talking about cycles. You're talking about generations. A lot of people compare the, the scores that we had 20, 25, 30 years back, that was uh, 190 to 240. I think a good score was 250. Um, but with field placing restrictions, obviously everybody about in the circle, it allows people to change the game and to start eating the ball over the top. And then obviously the higher, higher the scores are, the, the better the cricket sounds. But it's obviously field placing that makes a difference. And uh, a tip for, for bowlers of today, you got to have variations. You got to be clever. You got to evolve. You have to. You can't rely on what you have. Bob Wilmer and I listened to Dorsey, um, uh, the previous uh, discussion, and he talked about Bob Wilmer uh, and his innovativeness. He brought that to the team. He was one of those guys that said, "Listen, son, you've made the team because of your away swinger, because of your off cutter, but I haven't seen you bowl Yorkers yet. Let's go and develop that." And and and. He, he made batsmen all around us and he made fielders all around us and he made bowlers all around us. I'm not talking about batting and bowling. I'm talking about inside your, your niche market that you own. And that made him a good coach. And it's a pity. He was the most, the most effective that I've seen. Um, I haven't seen too many. But uh, of, of, of discussions in the past, he's the only guy that really took a Dale Cullen and, and said, listen, your son, you've got all the talent in the world. You play this beautiful, you play that better than anybody else. You can do this and that, but you cannot sweep. You have to start sweeping the ball. And it's wonderful to see those kind of guys uh, evolving the game of cricket. Awesome. So, Ravi, I'm going to get into the comment section because there's a lot of comments coming in. If you want to add to any of the comments, sure. just chip in before before Fanny answers them. Yep. So, um, bring it up, bring it up, bring it up. Cool. Ravi, just a second. Uh, Ravi, just a second. If I if sure. I go off, I need to I need to. Uh, it looks like my phone is going dead here. Um, okay. I need to uh, get back to you guys. I need to get off my phone quickly, or something is wrong. I'm not too sure what it is. So if I disappear, I'll be back in a minute. All right. Okay. Cool. That's no perfect. problem. No problem. That's perfect. Meetup okay, will cool. whip out the comments in the meantime. Yeah. So okay. Cool. The first one for you <clears throat> is just that. Did you have any pre-game rituals or superstitions? Okay, so we're going to get back to the comments when Fanny comes back on. So first, Ravi. You can pretend like you're that. asking me the question, sir. Talk, but so talk, I had talk a with... game with you. <laughs> <laughs> so now we got that out of the way that you are actually 45 years old. We know now that you are 45 and it has been confirmed like by the Hugh legend Jackman Fanny. 45. A huge Jackman 45. <laughs> like a Wolverine type of thing. Yeah. He's actually 200. But he looks so awesome. He's 40 years old. Oh, wow. <laughs> So um, I just want you to run me through some of that. Um, tell the fans exactly what it feels for you to be able to sit there and talk to Fanny. I'm going to be back in two seconds as well. I just need to change the light. But just tell the fans what you think about that. Well done. It's awesome. Uh, uh, hi, fans. Hi, cricket fanatics. Um, yeah, no, it's an absolute pleasure to speak to the likes of Fanny de Villiers. As I mentioned before in the beginning of the video, he's one of the first pro tiers. I've had the pleasure of watching on uh, national television, and I enjoyed all of his exploits from his tour in India. Sorry, his tour of uh, England to the tour of Australia. The, the Australian tour being the biggest one of them. He seems to be a fantastic competitor against uh, our rival nation, Australia. And I and I think that for me is one of those things which sort of set the wheels in motion. I think we started seeing a lot of fantastic away performances from every touring South African side that, that entered Australia. Mm. And um, I think finally De Villiers played a vital role in that respect. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think, uh, and I might be a bit facetious by saying this, but I think the likes of Dale Stein, Vernon Philander, they probably all watched these performances and said, we want to do exactly the same thing that finally De Villiers yeah. did here in 1993-94. Yeah. Let's let's just rock and roll. Let's go to Australia and do the same thing. Let's make magic happen. Yeah. So we got him back in the stream. Thank 
thankfully. Okay, so Fanny, you're back. <laughs> let's uh, get into your comments. Um, let's get into the first comment of the. Oh, no, you really is Fanny. Yeah. You really is Fanny. So the first. <laughs> Okay, so that now we know what the, the key to your fun of Fadi is. So let's this. You, you asked me. You asked me early on to allude to where fun of is coming from. There was a guy called Lapa that mm -hmm. uh, was a writer for trans for the Transvaal in those days, and uh, and I couldn't get into the team because I thought I was Afrikaans, and obviously because of the Afrikaans kind of English um, uh, uh, history. And it was difficult to break into the system. And I remember my first two, three games that I played, I didn't even bowl in the Northern Transvaal side. I was just a fielder. And one of them, I was the, the, the fielder of the night. And in those days, I think we got paid 10 bucks uh, from Basin Edges to be the fielder of the day or the player of the day or the batsman or the bowler for that matter. And Lapala Baskachni dubbed me um, uh, uh, Finna Gefani. And uh, that obviously, uh, everybody remembered that. And, and since then, uh, I was fun of funny. It's amazing. So it's not chasing oh. women or anything of the sort. <laughs> you know, I was telling, I was actually telling Khalid that I used to emulate your bowling action, funny, in the backyard at our house in Cape Town. Mm. I used to emulate your bowling action. Unfortunately, not too much success. I used to get slugged all over the place. Unfortunately, uh, my <laughs> bowling was left to be desired. Unfortunately. <laughs> so let's get <laughs> You, so this uh, between your uh, actually between yours and and Goffy Darren Goff, I tried the whole um, ball behind the head type of thing, and then the and then your case was the ball behind the back type of thing, and both the work unfortunately. Yeah. Well, people couldn't see obviously with with off cutters and the how the ball swung, they couldn't see what I did with the ball, how I held it because the kind of wrist was uh, cocked back, and it worked for me. It looked terrible, mm -hmm. but it worked. That's awesome. Oh, definitely, so we're definitely. <laughs> So let's get into comment one, and that's one from Craig Sturton. So he says, did you have any pre-game rituals or superstitions? The game is a tough game already. I, I had no, none whatsoever. Uh, from mm -hmm. pads to, to, to walking around to the left, to the right, around your, your, your marker, I had absolutely nothing. And I think you need to be calculated. It's such mm -hmm. a difficult game. Why do you make it? Why do you want to make it? Even worse. And superstition. Um, I wonder what the the religion level is within people if, if superstitions are playing a big role. It shouldn't be playing roles. <laughs> That's a brilliant answer. What from Alistair was a big fan of you. A few weeks ago. We'll talk to you about superstition of this. <laughs> <laughs> so Alistair's a massive fan for you. He was he, he really wanted to come on as a guest as well, but he couldn't make it. But he said, um, you had a nasty injury in the early 90s. Did you tweak your bowling action as a result? Mm -mm. Um, no. I always had stiff hammies. Uh, had a back operation when I was 19 years old, a fusion of, of vertebrae, uh, because I grew quite quickly and I um, I was a javelin thrower, plus a fast bowler, and never never really recovered properly until I ended up on the operating table. Um, a nasty injury. I had, I cut my fingers in a lawnmower at one stage. These rolling lawnmowers. Um, that was just before I retired in 98. Yeah. Um, I think that was early, late 97. Um, that got me out of the game for about four, six weeks, four to six weeks. But uh, no, not really. I always yeah. had a crooked action and a crooked run-up and, a, and a wasn't the best athlete. <laughs> you also mentioned another injury. You said you had a nasty freak injury before your debut ODI when India toured in 1992. What happened over there? Well, what happened was I played in the Rebel Tours um, and I was fairly successful, I thought, um, to stay in the system. And when, uh, when, when the Gatting Tour got called off um, and we got back into international cricket, uh, Ezra Mosley was a fast bowler and he was a nasty uh, piece of work when it, when, with a cricket ball fast. Um, a difficult guy. Uh, used to moan about everything when it comes to run-ups and, and wet uh, outfields and, 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 and. And I remember the specific practice, thought I'll be opening the bowling, obviously, when we break into the international scene um, with the likes of Alan Donald or Corey from Sale. Um, and he came from about a meter and a half to two meters to the right of the crease because of, of foot marks 
and I was batting at that stage. You, you used to scratch the ball against the the uh, you know to get reverse swing against the mm. um, fence, and that you used that obviously to to bowl to the top order batsman, and he did that to me, and it hit me on the toe and it broke my toe. So the oh. bone on top of the toe was broken, and and I was out for those early India games, uh, Barbados Test match, and uh, the World Cup. And just after the World Cup, I started playing cricket again. Uh, Mary Pringle was selected. Uh, thought I, I was in trouble. Knew he didn't have the pace, but he had beautiful swing. Uh, but when I got back onto the field again, obviously it worked out well for me, and, and I was back into the side again. So I missed that early Barbados Test match, that uh, one-day games in India, and also the World Cup 92. But uh, that was a, a, a Ezra Mosley injury more than anything else. Cool. Um, another one from Alice is who was the best captain you played under? <clears throat> um, you got to defy captaincy. You 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 need to understand um, how important the marketing of the game is from a captain's point of view. You need to understand the um, the dynamics of, of of mobilizing the team to higher levels when it comes to training methods. Um, you need to, to also uh, look at man management skills. Um, you need to have a look at the knowledge of the game, of the individual. Uh, we're talking weights here. One's got a bigger weight than the other. And I haven't even mentioned um, the likes of, of the respect from other players around you that also plays a way. So if, if, if you talk marketing ability, a captain that, that was the best marketer of cricket, that got more people to watch the game of cricket, um, it was Hansi Konya. Knowledgeable cricket, it was Kepler Vessels. Before him, without a doubt, without a doubt, my old captain, Clive Rice. Um, domestically, I mean, he was just fantastic. And obviously, in the Rebel Tours, he was brilliant. Uh, couldn't see him properly on the international circuit. I thought he would have probably been the best of the lot because of his all-roundership, uh, his, his rapport that he had with, with world cricket. He would have been absolutely wonderful and amazing. Jimmy Cook was also a captain. Um, but uh, you, need to, you need to understand the different dynamics and you need to tell me which dynamic is probably the most important. Then I can tell you how good a captain as Sean Pollock would have been uh, right through to whoever was the captain. And, but I think your marketing ability is one of the biggest weights of a captain. Um, yeah. uh, that plays a massive role to mobilize people, mobilize the union, mobilize the media, uh, a link between the, the public and the players. Uh, Hansi Konya was absolutely wonderful with that. But I think Kepler yeah. Wessels was a very knowledgeable guy. Um, later on in Hansi Konya's era, I don't know how effective he was knowledge-wise, but uh, without a doubt, um, somebody that that, uh, that would have been remembered uh, so much more if things didn't go the yeah. way he did. I mean, that's a factor that we as journalists these days in press conferences, we look at that uh, um, aspect. And something that we see in Faf, for example, is the way he talks to the media, etc. He knows exactly how to stay calm in front when difficult questions are being asked. So that is quite an amazing point that you raised over there. Um, we've got one from Daniel. Yeah, <laughs> Because that's, and where the public, the, yeah. that's where the true, true measurement comes. How much yeah. the public enjoys a player. Um, Graham Smith, for instance, at start, the, the public didn't enjoy him. Later on, they enjoyed him. Um, mm -hmm. Sean Pollock was left by the public from start. Hamsi Konya was adored uh, by the public. Um, interesting, something that you won't know. Uh, uh, Ali Bacher, when we, when we started talking about the next captain, Ali Bacher told all of us, that we should pick our own captain in the team. Um, but you would like to see a captain that's going to be there for quite a while. And uh, one of the first guys that we spoke to was John T. Rhodes. Oh. Because he was the best marketer of the game of cricket. He was uh, uh, the most loved in South Africa. And, uh, and, and I, I remember asking him, would you like to be captain of South African cricket? And he said, he straight away said to me, fine, geez, like he says, I'm still looking up to you guys. How can I be the captain of all the senior players in this team? And uh, when we spoke to Hansi, he immediately says, yes, I'll take it. I'll do it. What must I do? So uh, interesting from my point of view, uh, John T. Rose, as far as I'm concerned, was, was probably I 
first before I'm sick on If I may uh, ask as job. well, if I may ask as well, Fanny, if that's all right. Um, when Kepler returned uh, to the South African fold, or uh, well, rather I should say when he made his debut for South Africa, because we all know that he had, uh, had a fantastic career with Australia leading up to his tenure with South Africa. What was the reaction like uh, of the Australian fans when Kepler arrived in South African colours? I didn't really pick anything up. I think there were a few boos and and, and ahs, but um, everybody so looked forward to <coughs> sorry, seeing the South African team that I don't think that was the issue at all. I can't remember one instance that uh, that somebody made an issue out of that. Sure. No, can't tell. Yeah. <clears throat> so we got an awesome one from Daniel. This is Manila Villas. I believe your first wicket was Shane Warren. Tell us what that felt like. First test match, Melbourne. I think our tactics were a bit wrong. We were very conservative, bowling outside the off stump most of the time. Even with a way swing, you need to bowl straighter to get the next. And they just left the ball all the time. And, and uh, he came in as a night watch and I got him out. Um, first test wicket, I would have liked uh, a better one. But Cullinan kept on dropping it at first. I think Cullinan, we dropped the first one at first slip, then we moved into second slip, then he dropped another one, and then we moved into third slip, he dropped another one, then he moved into fourth slip, he dropped another one, and then he went to final leg. It just follows you. Just follows you. <laughs> so we started to bowl Australia out, but the game ran out. So uh, he couldn't rectify his catching ability that specific game. <laughs> Long time back. Yeah, this is a quite. A, I don't know if it's controversial, really, but I, I just. Um, Alistair says that I just left the press box when Cameron Bancroft was doing something dodgy. <laughs> you were the first to notice Australia were tamping with the ball. What led you to pick up, pick it up so quickly? Well, everybody knew that something was wrong because they got reverse swing in the first test match in Durban. <laughs> um, I think in the twentieth over, I yeah. wasn't commentating, and I said it's impossible it to there. see that early in South Africa. Then the second test match, uh, I was in PE, and um, obviously the whole Super Sport production talked about it, and a lot of guys um, came to me and spoke to me. Um, it could have been cameraman, it could have been it could have been anybody, but I know a lot of people ask me about um, reverse swing, and I said it's impossible to swing the to reverse swing the ball before 30 overs in South Africa. Our wickets don't allow it. There's enough grass covering. Uh, the ball stays intact. Um, you have to go to, to, to 30 odd overs and you have to wet it in South Africa a hell of a lot to make it heavier to get reverse swing. And uh, even in the, in, the, in the Port Elizabeth test match, you remember how they scrutinized um, Warner's hands with the yeah. plasters on? Um, mm -hmm. Kuplisi kind of alluded to uh, pointing fingers to him uh, that he's doing something. Uh, so I think something happened already in Port Elizabeth in the next game in Cape Town. Or in Cape Town, rather, the next game things started. Well, in Cape Town, things started going high wire. Things but started everybody getting was on it and uh, mm. expecting it to happen uh, already at that stage. Yeah, I remember that clearly. I mean, that was my first ever um, Australia Test match, or the second Test I've ever covered before. So it was quite a, a remarkable um, journey for me and jumpstart my career. Base jumpstart my career basically going forward um, at that point. Um, <clears throat> Abai says, um, your son, Fani Jr., is now based in New Zealand and he's in the club scene there. I think he's a seam bowling all around. How's, it, <clears throat> how's he going there? And based on your experiences, what are your what is your advice for youngsters? Well, uh, firstly, I think we, we're entering and we have entered a world where cricket is a global game. And it's not just a professional game. It's a global game that can, can get you to understand the global world so much better. If I had the opportunity to go to New Zealand in those days, or Australia for that matter, um, uh, it would have been absolutely wonderful. And if I could have used cricket, uh, knowing that there was going, wasn't going to be international cricket, I would have used cricket to go and find myself a job in another country just to get the global experience and, and obviously, the worthwhile pound versus rand would have made a big difference. Mm. And I would have come back to South Africa 10, 15 years later and set myself up. And that's what the global world does these days. I think cricket has opened up the doors. My boy went overseas to go and find out what the global world is all about. 
he immediately walked into a great job. He's earning good money. In actual fact, he's probably earning more money than he would playing uh, professional cricket, uh, not international cricket, but professional cricket. And he needs to make a choice soon if he needs still to play professional cricket. Um, he's looking for residency. He's very close to residency, and that will obviously open up the doors for him to be selected. He's already played for uh, representative sites, but very much friendlies and tours to Australia. But when it comes to uh, uh, normal first-class cricket, they play with their test players and overseas players. Um, the advice will be, go and find out what the world is all about. Use cricket. If you can't become a, a top cricket player in this country, use cricket, use hockey, use rugby to get overseas, uh, get a foot into a country and get and, and work there and find out what life is all about and then come back to your own country and make a difference here. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity that cricket creates and sport creates for that matter. Um, I do hope that a lot of people use that and I don't think there's enough opportunities these days. Cricket has, has done such a great job marketing the game. I think all of us as players have done a massive job marketing the game of cricket, uh, open up, opening up the world of cricket, uh, the world of the finances that you can earn in cricket and that opens up so many more players that wants to become good cricket players and there's just not enough space anymore. And Ravi, if you go back 30 years back when I started playing cricket, um, I think it was quite easy to get into a into a, a proper system. We had Dorsey, uh, how, how we got into the system. Uh, not enough players specialised in those days. Today, right. you've got every single school mm. um, in cricket. Every second uh, and you've got just to make it. And it's wonderful uh, to see how many good cricket players there are in club cricket. They mm. all cannot play international cricket and international cricket. And they need That's to right. go. They need to go and find out if they're good enough to I, play. I, I think if I could add, if I could add funny as well, um, the lifespan of a sportsman is very limited as well. So you'd want to exploit that uh, your skill set as much as you can. And if you need to go across borders, you just have to do it. Um, instead of just waiting and wondering what, what could have happened. You know, Gloucester shared one stage played with nine South African cricket team and cricket players. <laughs> That's how good our cricket players are. I yeah. mean, if you can't. Yeah, I thought Warwickshire yeah, yeah. took all the South Africans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's wonderful to see how. I mean, there's over 600 uh, cricket players playing cricket overseas and coming back. You know, in our league, in Northern, the Northern Transvaal League, we've got, I heard the other day, 12 SA schools players. SA schools players that can't make it into the Northern side. There's sure. not enough space. And then you've got development too that obviously blocks out a certain amount. And it doesn't matter if you're black or white. You, you, there's not enough space, not enough yeah. places to play. And those guys must go. They must go and find out if they're good enough to play the global game. And from there, they might get into the IPL. Who knows? Yeah. I think true. what was really an eye-opener, Khalid actually engages quite a bit with the under-19 cricketers. And one of the, the, the cricketers in the recent World Cup he said that uh, they're going to make the most of this game because this is the last time they'll play with each other as a unit. And it didn't occur to me that uh, what he's saying is, is 100% true because some of these guys actually stop playing cricket at that point and actually go back to university because the demand um, has sort of changed in the game. Uh, the requirements is difficult. And I think there's a lot more channels you need to go through from that point just to get uh, recognition at franchise level. I mean, we can talk about a guy like Herman Rolf yeah, I think, <clears throat> that, I think that what everybody is chasing. Khalid, I think what everybody chases, if you if you you just want the equal start, and you've got a lot of honest young cricket players that's good enough to play, that just needs an equal start to make teams. And if you look at white players, there's not enough equal start for those guys. And if you look at black players, that's good. That's wonderful cricket players coming out of school. There's not an equal start for them too because you need somebody to subsidize those guys. They need, they need strong families behind them to look after them for four or five years before they're really good enough to play. And all these cricket academies only looks after those young players for one or two years maximum, and then they throw them to the wolves. That's why most of those youngsters don't make it later. It's not because they're not good enough. It's because there's nobody subsidizing their salaries. There's nobody that can drive them to the grounds and back and, and wherever they need to work to earn a living. So for both sections of our, uh, our society, 
there's not an equal start. And that makes it very, very difficult for a lot of young players. Yeah. But the stars uh, in nice... That's what Mr. O was saying. Mr. O was yeah. saying that on Sunday. Yeah. 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 This ties in nicely into the next question from Craig, which is, can you compare the contrast and the depth at domestic level between your era and this domestic game at present? It's crap. Today's domestic cricket is crap. There's no better word for it. It's 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 30% weaker than when we play. It's 40% weaker than when we play. And the reason for that is that you had the best players in the world that played cricket in South Africa. You had uh, uh, my club cricket team, my club cricket team. The opening bowlers was myself and Sylvester Clark. Tertius Boss, number three. Gerald Grober, number four. Willie Morris, number five. That's my club cricket team. I used to drive to, to uh, Johannesburg to go and watch um, Clive Rice and those kind of guys playing club cricket. They're not talking about provincial cricket. You've got number eight, nines, and tens, and elevens making hundreds today. And I'm talking about big hundreds <laughs> that um, he try and make hundreds against Sylvester Clark and Vince van der Beel and, 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 and the likes no of chance. Stephen Jeffries and Ralph <laughs> Lurie. You've got no, no chance. <laughs> no chance. No ways. So I'm afraid to say the game is not as good as it was, but that's relative to what's going on in South Africa. I think we're trying to give everybody a chance to play. I think the coaches are really weak. Um, uh, Dorsey alluded to it uh, and he just touched on it how important it was to play with the likes of a Sylvester Clark and uh, Malcolm Marshall and those guys uh, and then on top of that to have a coach like, uh, like, like all the top players in the past that was part of cricket to evolve the game quicker not to, mm. not to just do the basics to evolve the game quicker to teach a bowler the seven, eight things that makes a ball swing not to tell a bowler you've got to aim the seam towards first slip and now you've got to try and swing it. I'm talking about guys that knows absolutely nothing that's coaching cricket today. And I'm talking level three coaches. Level three coaches that learns from the books how to swing a ball and how that's not it. That's not what I know about swing bowling is not even level four coaching manuals. Sure. And I'm afraid to say that hampers a lot of success from a lot of young players. Uh, that, that makes it very difficult for them to evolve quicker and quickly enough. And I'm, 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 I'm saying it categorically. The game is 30-40% weaker than it was. Um, and I'm talking about 20 years back when I stopped playing cricket. Sure. I'm, just gonna I'm not talking about one... internet cricket. I'm not talking... Yeah. I'm talking about the best in the world and the best in the country that's using the IPL and all the knowledge they gather overseas playing international cricket. I'm not talking about international cricket players. I'm talking domestic cricket. Yeah. Do you think, why do you think Dorsey's not even watching? It's frustrating to go and watch opening bowlers <laughs> in the first five, six, seven. You guys are going to have a look bowling 15 wides. I, I think we're That's singing terrible. from the same hymn sheet there, Fanny. I'll, I'll be honest, we, we all feel the same way, more or less, uh, maybe with different iterations. But I agree. I mean, when I used to watch Super Sports CDs 24 years ago, and uh, just as a reminder, I was in my teens at the time. Um, I would go to uh, Newlands and you would see the likes of Neil Johnson clapping 100. But that was against a very formidable bowling attack comprised of Brett Schultz and Merrick Pringle. Um, you, you don't see those kind of uh, interactions anymore. I, 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 there are some merits in what you were saying just now. Absolutely. Yeah. Funny, how do you I think, think we can... I think a very good... I think you have to... You have to um... Try and defend a statement like that. Um, firstly, if you look at bullies, from Kun that making that makes two hundreds to Cook, um, that's a far, that that's a guy that played cricket for South Africa that opened the batting that couldn't make it at the highest level, right through to to all the youngsters that get a markroom included. I mean, they bullies at provincial cricket, but they can't make it at the international cricket. They struggle to make it at international cricket. They use 20, 30 test matches to become good enough just to just to make the team. I'm not talking about the world beaters. Why don't they make it at the highest level? And I'm talking about from Hendricks right through to everybody, Hamza, all of those guys. How can they be so good at provincial cricket but not in international cricket? Because the gap is so much wider these days. Talk and that's sad because the all if they played in our era with good bowlers, good education, knowledgeable people that can mobilize the evolving of the game so much quicker for the individuals, they all would have been fantastic cricket players. 
but they got to go to international cricket and then they got to start all over again and learn their trade at international cricket because club cricket and provincial cricket is so crap. Sad. Sad yeah. story. It's very really sad. Is there any way we can fix that? How do we how do we fix that and remedy that? And, and at least many a time. Can I tell you a story? They uh, Ali Bachet Ali Bache decided many years back to have an international coaching panel. Um, and I just stopped in 1998. They got Graham Pollock in, myself in, Clive Rice in, Jimmy Cook as a right hand opening batsman, Kepler Vessel as a left hand opening batsman. They had a spinner, they had everybody. And they kitted us out with jacket and tie and track suits. And we were going, we, were, we gave three, four days a month of our time for nothing, for no money, to go and visit the likes of different stadiums at their nets, to have a look at the players, to report back to the union, and also to help the local coaches and advise the young players on how to evolve quicker because we've played international cricket. We know what it takes. We know what the workload is. We know how much hours you should spend on muscle, muscle endurance, and all of that versus bowling. And, and we kind of know the recipe or knew the recipe. Within the first four weeks, they dismantled it. I remember I went to Cape Town um, to Bulan, and uh, a fast bowler was bowling. And in actual fact, I had a chat with the fast bowlers, and I asked the guys, chaps, um, let's, I, I, I can see some of you guys bowling wide deliveries and it swings beautifully, but straight there doesn't swing. Let's just huddle together. I want to talk to you guys. So I had a chat with them and I said, why does the ball not swing close to the stumps, but wide of the stumps? It swings a hell of a lot. If you bowl that far outside of stump. No, they don't. No, they don't. I said, guys, what makes the ball swing? Now they talk about aerodynamics makes the ball swing and the seam pointing. In the... I said, right, what makes, what makes the ball swing late? Nobody knew. So I said, if you've got a new ball and you're running into bowl and you bowl the first one and it doesn't swing, what do you do? One out said, you change the ball around and if it doesn't swing, no, no, then the ball can't swing. One out of six, one, two out of six balls can't swing or three or four out of six can't swing. Uh, you this, is new lens. this is a new lens. Uh, <coughs> This is now, well, this specific case was in, in, uh, in, in, in at Bula. And I said, but what about, what about if you hold the ball on the seam, angling it then towards first slip and bowl it, and if it doesn't swing, then turn it around and also angle it and bowl it, and if it doesn't swing, then you know you're in trouble here. But that, when you what you do then, is you run and you bowl a test delivery. Your first delivery is a test delivery. That far outside off stump, and if that one swings, you know they swing in the air, there's enough humidity, and the ball does swing, now you have to find out in your action how to do this, and the one next to the coach, why haven't you taught us this? You see how the game can evolve quicker if you've got knowledgeable player. That guy ended up moaning because I didn't, I didn't, I probably made him look bad because I had another four things that could make a ball swing that they didn't even know about, and they all went to the guys, where, where have you been? And that's where the difference comes in with knowledgeable people that can mobilize a young player with test knowledge towards the knowledge of test cricket, not towards the knowledge of provincial cricket, his aim will be bigger. His fitness endurance, his fitness levels will be bigger because he's got somebody that's played the game at the highest level telling them exactly what to do and they will do it. They will believe it. And they can say what they want. If you haven't played international cricket, if you haven't got the respect of the players and you want to advise them on certain things, and if it doesn't work, they're going to lose their job. I tell you now, the respect levels are not the same. And we, we were available. And then they stopped the whole thing. We didn't, none of us wanted to be coaches because we obviously got into the business world or, or had a good job with super sport or whatever the case might be. But we were willing to help. We were willing to evolve the game of cricket. And it just didn't happen. So uh, I'm afraid to say you can only be as good as the knowledgeable guys within the system, the senior players in the team. Uh, they normally overshadow the coach massively unless it's a Gary Kirsten or a Bob Wilmer. Otherwise, they'll be all over the coach and, and the knowledge inside the system, they, they think they know everything. And I've had a chat with from Andrew Hall right through to Sean Pollock on certain things that makes a ball swing that after their careers, they still didn't know. Amazing that you, sure. that you end up in a system that can't support you fully. So I'm going to end up with one more question before I give it back to Ravi. I just want to ask you, Abai says, you played a lot of international cricket before he was born. 
if you were if you were to recommend to him one test match and one ODI which you were involved in, what were your picks be for him to rewatch? It's a pity that we that the games that we played was very much SABC in those days, mm. um, top sport. And I think when uh, when Super Sport started um, 98, 97, it was difficult. 96, it was difficult to get footage. And yeah. I think uh, SABC just chucked it away. So you can't get footage unless it's unless it's um, Australian footage from somewhere. Yeah. Um, I think the Sydney game is a is a highly highly emotional game. It's worthwhile watching that. Um, uh, I played a, 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 a hell of a game in in at the Wanderers. Uh, also a test match against Pakistan. That was a, uh, it was the ball swung beautifully and, and obviously the art of swing bowling. You can have, have a look at that. But we also played a one-day game against Australia um, at the Wanderers. That was a uh, that was that was right down to the last ball and and the last run that we ended up winning. Um, and we so won by five games runs. Are the my era, but most eras, close games are always wonderful to watch. Yeah, of course. I can so actually add to that, uh, Fadi. I found the footage of uh, a game where South Africa played Pakistan in the Gaddafi Stadium in, in Pakistan. It was the final in a quadrangular. And you featured in that match. Mm -hmm. And that's a match where Sean Pollock uh, took three wickets in the very first over. He got Amir Sohail, Ijaz Ahmed, oh. and I think he got Yusuf Yana. All in the first over. And Wasn't that, that was the like, match in the King Commission? Sorry? Wasn't that the match that came out in the King Commission? No, no, I, I don't know about that. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it was about three years before, but no, no, you, you I think you said. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ravi, is there okay, anything so else you want to speak time. before? Sorry, Vanny. Um, not really. Just, I just want to, to, uh, you know. Sport is, a, is an unbelievable medium that I think parents and uh, the support structures should really look, look into how to get your child uh, or, the, or the specific person in the family to get the best advice, the best knowledge available. Yeah. And, and obviously with all the science involved to get that involved too because uh, if, if, if anybody can go and study a degree that can pay him 60, 70, 80 million a year, like what A.B. de Villiers probably earns, then it's worthwhile to investigate that. And I'm talking about mediocre cricket players uh, that's not even in the top number one, two, three, four, five in the world that's earning 15, 20, 30 million a year through IPL and local cricket. It's worthwhile to investigate the full package on how to develop your, your child in rugby or cricket. And it's not just the sport, it's the science. It's everything that's happening behind the scenes the right schools, um, the right coaching uh, at an early age, it makes a massive difference and it makes it easier at a higher level uh, in an older when you when you are after school. So please yeah. investigate it. It's, it's definitely worthwhile to have a look at it. And if you don't make it yet, it's still a global game that can get you anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world. Ravi, any final words? Yeah, thanks, guys. And uh, I would like to extend this uh, thank you to good old Peter for introducing me to Fani as well. And eventually getting him on the show. Funny at this juncture, what what we normally ask um, our interviewees is just to share with the fanatics what it is that you're currently doing. I believe you're a master of ceremonies mm -hmm. as well. Perhaps you can uh, unpack with the fans as to how they can best reach you for similar functions and events. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm very much a super sport. It's part of my life, and and MC and golf days and all those. Obviously, I'm I'm a guest speaker. At, uh, at, 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 um, uh, at companies where we talk about, I draw a wonderful parallel between business and sport and how sport goes way, way beyond reasonability into the world of success and, and, and um, uh, excellence. And everything in the company normally evolves around reasonable effort, reasonable people, reasonable this and reasonable that. So uh, to draw a parallel between those two is brilliant to hear. And uh, it just takes most companies performances to the next level and they're planning obviously everybody looks at processes and procedures um, but I'm afraid to say when it comes to sport the processes and procedures are better than you have in businesses because you have to there's 
there's not just 10% of people actively involved in the company. You've got 11 out of 11 actively involved and, mm -hmm. and evolving the game too. And if, we, if one can use that knowledge in our companies, it can really work well. And then I'm part of a security company, Omega Security. I'm on the Exco, um, uh, uh, doing big contracts, obviously, around the country. And, and what's the space of Xylomet? It's a pharmaceutical company that I'm also involved in. Uh, that's doing from cancer medicine right through to to wow. to uh, the herbal medicines. Um, Xylomet's going to be huge. Uh, that's what I'm involved in. And if anybody's trying to get hold of me, uh, my email is uh, uh, is easy to to remember. It's just FDV, it's just Fanny Davilia, at omegasol.com, Omega Solutions, omegasol.com. Uh, that's that's the email they can get hold of me. FDV at omegasol.com. So guys. That's all we have for you for today. This episode of Legends with Ravi. Thank you a lot, Fanny, for coming on the show. Thank you a lot to you, Ravi. Thank you to the fans out there that have commented and asked you all your questions. Don't forget to like this video. Don't forget to share this with all your friends. Don't forget to click the subscribe button. Click the notification bell. And we will catch you again next week with another episode. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone.